uh, welcome you uh, to the guest speaker lectures. Uh, this has been made possible by the uh, COP Charitable Foundation, so we're very thankful to them. Uh, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Scott Sumner, our distinguished speaker today. Dr. Sumner is a professor of economics at Bentley University. He received his PhD from the University of Chicago. Uh, and his research has been mainly uh, on the field of monetary economics, uh, particularly on the Great Depression. Uh, Sumner, Dr. Sumner, just began research on the relationship between cultural values and neoliberal reforms, but then with the financial crisis, he got pulled back into studying monetary policy. And he started blogging uh, two years ago. Uh, the name of his blog is uh, The Money Illusion. And he told me last night that he started uh, blogging because he started getting frustrated about monetary policy and he wanted to change how monetary policy is run nowadays and he wanted to have an impact on monetary policy today. Uh, Dr. Sumner uh, has published several articles in journals such as Journal of Political Economy, the Journal of Money, Credit and Banking, the Bulletin of Economic Research, The Economist, among other many journals. Uh, he will be presenting his lecture today. He will talk between 30 to 40 minutes. Then um, Dr. Sumner, Sumner also told me that he will be open to questions during his presentation. So he really wants to get a feeling about uh, how you guys are uh, doing with the material and, and, and his ideas. So feel free to raise questions along the presentation. But then we will have a, a couple. We will have like around 10 minutes for Q and A towards the end. Uh, yeah, between 10 and 15 minutes. Uh, we also have a reception, thanks to the uh, Cloud Foundation, uh, around, around 1, once we finish the lecture. So please uh, feel free uh, to go to the, to the reception. Dr. Sumner will be there also. If you have uh, questions or more further conversation on the topic, he'll hang out at the reception. So I hope you, you're able to take advantage of that. So please uh, join me to welcome Dr. Sumner today. So I'd like to thank uh, Lisa Blanco and also Dean Wilburn for inviting me uh, to this uh, very beautiful campus. I have to say I'm a little bit jealous of uh, you guys. Uh, we had a brutal winter in Boston shoveling snow, so coming out here it seems kind of like paradise by comparison. And um, so anyway, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'll be uh, talking today about uh, the crash of 2008 and the, the recession, monetary policy, and um, market efficiency, sort of time permitting. Um, I see these two issues as related, and um, you'll see why as we go along. Um, but um, first, a little bit about myself, and uh, Luis already mentioned sort of how I got into uh, blogging. Um, in fact, you know, in a sense, the reason I'm here is because of this crisis. I, I wasn't a particularly well-known academic uh, before 2008. Um, and uh, I got into blogging because I realized that my research on the Great Depression and the Japanese liquidity trap and uh, forward-looking monetary policies, which is my three major research areas, uh, gave me sort of a different take or insight on the crisis from what I was seeing from others. And um, you'll find my view probably very unconventional, um, regardless of whether your professors are sort of liberal Keynesians or conservative monetarists. I, I have a, a different take from almost anyone else, and I suppose that's why I'm here, because in the blogosphere, if you have something new to say, then you, you get noticed, especially if people find it interesting. And I've been fortunate that other economists have had some good things to say about me, and otherwise I probably wouldn't have uh, got much readership. Um, so anyway, uh, and again, it will be a controversial uh, talk, um, and I certainly welcome questions and, and challenges to my point of view, and also clarification questions as I go along. Um, let me start doing the slides. Um, one common view is that the events of 2008 and the subprime bubble sort of discredit the efficient markets hypothesis, and I'm going to argue just the reverse, um, that in some sense the crisis happened because we didn't take this theory seriously enough. Um, 
And also, I'm going to argue that uh, almost everyone is, is at least partially wrong about what happened in the crash of 2008. Uh, I don't think that this was a, um, the root cause was a financial crisis, but rather contractionary monetary policy. And right off the bat, that's pretty controversial because most people in the media and in the economics profession saw monetary policy as being not just expansionary, but highly expansionary in late 2008. So obviously I'll have to do some explaining to try to convince you of the alternative view. Um, let's start off with a fairly uh, common or consensus view. Um, this is just the first four sentences by, um, in an article by Robert Hall, a very distinguished economist in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, just came out in a symposium on the crisis. And I think this is a fairly commonly held view, these thoughts, but if you look closely, it, it may not actually accurately describe what happened. Let's start with the first two sentences. We have the worst financial crisis and the Great Depression followed. Is that true? Well, having studied the Great Depression, I noticed that the first banking crisis did not actually occur until more than a year into the Great Depression. And I would argue that the causality ran the opposite direction, that the Great Depression itself caused increasingly severe banking crises as we went into the 1930s. One variable that I'll, I emphasize a lot in my blog is nominal GDP, the total dollar value of income in the economy. And in the Great Depression, that fell in half. So four years into the Depression, people were earning on average half as much as four years earlier. You can imagine how hard it is to repay loans when your income on average has fallen in half. It's not surprising there was a banking crisis. Some might point to the stock market crash, which did happen right at the beginning of the Depression. But I think we now know that stock market crashes by themselves cannot cause depressions. How do we know that? Well, in 1987, there was a stock market crash that was eerily similar to 1929. If you overlay the two graphs, they're almost identical. And uh, there wasn't even the tiniest blip in the economy after the 1987 stock market crash. GDP kept rising steadily for the next three years. So a stock market crash, even of the type of 1929, doesn't seem to by itself cause a depression or even a mild recession necessarily. Now what about 2008? Here it's a little more complicated. Um, clearly there was a subprime crisis before the recession. So you can certainly talk about causality going from that to the recession. However, I think it was more complicated. Notice that Robert Hall mentions the um, second worst financial crisis struck in the fall of 2008. That's after Lehman Brothers failed. And I'm going to argue that that, which was sort of the intensification of an earlier subprime crisis, in fact, represented a feedback from a weakening economy. So even there, the causation to some extent went from the recession to the banking crisis. What made this more complicated was we started with a modest-sized banking crisis, went into a severe recession, and the banking crisis worsened. And I'll show you some evidence for that later on. Um, OK, here's uh, an interesting graph that shows estimates of monthly real GDP in 2008 and 9. Now, the government doesn't actually calculate monthly GDP, they calculate quarterly. But this was put together using some data, uh, monthly frequency data, by macroeconomics advisors. And what it really shows is that much of the decline in the economy took place in a very short period of about six months. Between June, see if I can use the, the laser here, the June point there, <coughs> December, which is there. So from June to December 2008, real GDP saw most of the decline that occurred in the entire recession. Even though the recession was much longer, I think it was about 18 months in all, the big decline took place in a fairly short six-month period. Also notice that the financial crisis that Robert Hall talked about occurred about halfway through this decline. He mentioned the fall of um, 2008, September, October, November, that period. 
So I'm going to argue that part of the problem was that the financial crisis got much worse because of the weakening economy. Now, why did real GDP fall sharply? Um, the next slide shows nominal GDP. And if, if I toggle back and forth, you'll notice that these two look fairly similar, except nominal has a little more of an upward trend because of inflation being included. Um, but in this place, again, there was a peak in June. Um, and in December, the low point for nominal GDP was reached. Now, nominal GDP is something that most economists believe that monetary policy can, at least in principle, control. Um, even economists that are skeptical about whether monetary policy can control real GDP normally believe it can at least control nominal variables. And uh, furthermore, most mainstream economists think there's a connection. You probably have been taught models having to do with sticky wages and prices, so that if you have a decline in nominal spending, it doesn't just show up as falling prices, but also real output falls. So that's um, one of the connections that I would make here, that essentially monetary policy did not adequately support nominal GDP, allowed it to fall too much, and that led to a decline in real GDP as well. But even nominal GDP itself is interesting, as I mentioned. It's the resources people have to repay loans. On average, nominal GDP in America rises about 5% per year. That's about 3% real growth, 2% inflation. That's on average. Between mid-2008 and mid-2009, it fell about 3%, meaning it, it fell 8% below trend, normally 5% up. 3% down on this occasion. That means people had much less income to repay loans, and businesses also had much less income to repay loans than they expected prior to the um, drop in nominal GDP. So essentially, um, what I'm going to be arguing is that there were really two crises that were mislead, misdiagnosed as a single crisis. The first crisis, I think, people got right, and I don't have anything new or interesting to say about the subprime crisis. Clearly, a lot of mistakes were made by government policy, banks. You can find all sorts of villains. Loans were made that, in retrospect, never should have been made. And even if this had not happened to nominal GDP, a lot of subprime loans never would have been paid back. It was inevitable the, the bubble, so to speak, was going to burst. And, and I don't have much new to say about that. What I will talk about is the intensification of the crisis in the second half of 2008, which spread far beyond just the subprime mortgages. Now, I'm going to argue for the key role of monetary policy, and this is perhaps the most difficult claim I have to make, because most people uh, tend to think of monetary policy in terms of interest rates. Low interest rates are seen as easy money, high interest rates represent tight money. Uh, but it's more complicated than that, and um, the textbook I used by Frederick Mishkin, I can't remember this is the book used here? No, we use Mike. Okay, Mike. But this is for monetary economics, yeah. where I teach it's good, yeah. at Bentley. And, and this is, a, I believe, the number one uh, sales for money making books, at yeah. least when I adopted it. So it's a very uh, well known and distinguished textbook. Michigan was on the Board of Governors of the Fed. And um, here are three key points he uses to sort of summarize his conclusions about monetary mm -hmm. policy towards the end of the book. <coughs> First, it is dangerous to associate easing or tightening a monetary policy with falling or rising interest rates. Um, I claim that many economists slipped into this mistake. It's certainly true that oftentimes interest rates are informative about monetary policy, but they can be deceptive. And I think in this instance they were. Um, second, other asset prices uh, besides those on debt instruments. In other words, other indicators besides interest rates can tell us whether monetary policy is easy or tight. And finally, monetary policy can be highly effective in reviving a weak economy even if short-term rates are already near zero. I believe in late 2008, many people, even many economists, lost sight of this. Or maybe they never believed it in the first place because there are different schools of thought on the so-called liquidity trap. Frederick Mishkin is taking the view that interest rates at zero do not mean that the Federal Reserve is, quote, out of ammunition. There are still other things they could do to boost aggregate demand and nominal spending other than cut interest rates. 
So in one sense, the, although my view in my blog is very controversial,